and and that's how I moved to DC. Ah. <laughs> Make this yeah, I mean, God came through uh, one moment after the next. Just so, and when you leave now, you and Aika break up. Yeah, we're broken up. Uh, I kissed her for the last time in North Carolina as I left. Uh, and you now go to Washington. Washington, D.C., which I love. My best place in the U.S. is Washington, D.C. So first uh, and foremost, you get a salary. Imagine that. Uh, end month, there's something, or every 15 days, there's something coming in. Well, it, was, it wasn't regular, but I was, he was always paying me for something. Uh, and in, in one instance, he even shared some of his profits on a, on a deal that he did in, uh, in D.C. What? Okay, yeah. let's, 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 let's talk about D.C. First, first of all, from a, from a location perspective, this is very different from... North Carolina, isn't isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's night and day. DC is uh, extremely metropolitan. Uh, I mean, I remember walking down M Street, the famous street, uh, shopping district, mm. uh, and 1600 uh, White House. Yeah, 1600 crosses M Street. Huh? I remember walking down M Street one weekend, and for a solid 30 minutes of walking through crowds of people. I didn't hear a single person speak English. It what? was Hispanic, Italian, French, German. I mean, I was so jazzed by how cosmopolitan that city was at the time. I don't know if it still is. Mm. I haven't been there since I left the States. But, uh, I, and I loved that because, again, it was a bigger macrocosm of, of Savannah yes. College of Art and Design. Also, historic uh, town, master plan, old, old city. I think it's why I loved it the most mm. because it was like Savannah on steroids. Yeah. Plus uh, its proximity to Virginia, Maryland. It was just an interesting place mm. to be. So, you know, I ended up living there for seven months um, in, in the house that uh, my cousin Moots had remodeled. And, and, and now, did you start flipping as well? Yeah, I joined him. I, I, helped, I helped he and his wife Michiko. Uh, I think we flipped a couple of deals. Well, even uh, when he came to Kenya, you were just working. Yeah, yeah, I was working, you know, with with Michiko, his wife. We were doing house visits, negotiating with guys uh, for deals and so on. So, did 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 this improve your art of negotiating? By far, yeah. What I are mean, some of th- what are some of the key lessons that you learned? Uh, law of averages. You talk to enough people, you will find what you're looking for. So no, never giving up. Eating nose, in other words. Rejection became Eating nose, a requirement. Like yeah, you eat them, man. Uh, <laughs> if, <laughs> if you're looking for something, because you know a lot of people get re- discouraged when they're told no. Mm. They feel rejected. As if it's them being rejected or being indicted in some way or being told they're worthless. Yeah. When that's not always the case. Sometimes it is because of the person's prejudice and the spirit with which they say no. Mm. But regardless, you need to learn how to eat it and keep going. And uh, the law of averages <laughs> basically says, uh, you know... You're going to get a yes. You're going to get a yes. So find the yes. Mm-hmm. So I see it's eating the same thing those... you're telling me 10, 10, 10, and then one is a... Yeah, out of every 10, nine will tell you no, one will say yes. That's actually a law of average in sales huh? uh, for certain classes of, of, of products. Mm. Nine out of ten people will tell you no. So I learned that instead of being discouraged with a no, I used to count the no as the no <laughs> as my closest yes. step to the yes. It's another step closer to yes. Yeah, so I'm like yes, <laughs> closer to the yes. Because <laughs> so if, if, if I talk to hundred guys, I'm gonna get ten yeses, yeah. and I only need one yes. So just work ethic, man. You go, you go, you go. What does this typically look like? You just going to the same way you went and banged on that white old lady smoke his house absolutely it's the same way you do this total strangers you're having conversations my cousin moots was way more organized than i (laughs) uh he always has been he's like uh he's like an engineer minded uh type of guy not surprisingly his his dad my uncle john is a mathematics professor Mm. uh he was very systematic he had marketing systems in place. He would send out postcards to condemned property listings, foreclosure listings, 
every week. He'd spend, you know, a couple thousand dollars maybe sending postcards to these pre-qualified leads and law of averages again. Uh, maybe one out of a hundred will call back, mm. right? So you want as many calling back, therefore you send as many as you can. And then from those you pre-qualify and you have face-to-face -face meetings and you negotiate, some will say no, others will say yes. But the chance is deal. already there of people saying yes is already no, slashed to actually, like one in every two. Yeah, yeah. actually for him it was very predictable. Huh? He knew if I spend $2,000 this week, I'll close two deals this month. Yo. It was it was down to that sort of a science. And when you're saying postcards, you're literally talking about a letter. Proper postcards. And what's a postcard saying? Hey, I'd like to buy a... Your... Yes. This is, uh, front would say, I buy houses. Or we buy houses. Uh -huh. The back would say, hi, Mr. So-and-so. You know, we would be interested in purchasing your property. If you're keen on having a conversation, and call this number. selling $2,000 worth. Oh, po yeah. You're that is thousands. a lot. Yeah, Even if you say one is one dollar. That's oh, yeah, you're doing thousands of mail outs, you know. And thankfully, the postal service in the U.S. is organized. And where they, they, they know how to handle all that. Okay, is there another lesson you learned in negotiating? Yes, um, I still use it to this day. Uh, basic human psychology and etiquette. Always make eye contact. First one to blink loses. <laughs> Seriously. Now, especially if you're the one trying to get a deal. The other party is trying to check you out. Mm. Like, do you have hidden motives? Are you serious? Are you not? And something as basic as eye contact, it's very primal. Uh, but it betrays, a lot of times it will betray people's lack it's of the confidence. Window, it's the window to the soul. Absolutely. It sounds silly, I know, but I have proven it. I prove it every day. You make eye contact, you smile, have a pleasant demeanor because no one wants to talk to a sourpuss. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're looking friendly and inviting, people want to engage more. So you have to be presentable. You can't have bad breath. Yeah. You have to have oiled your face. Uh, you need to be inviting. Uh, very important. Those are the basics. We actually... Later on, I learned there's actually an acronym for it. It's called the C-Factor, S-E-E, -E, uh, which is smile, uh, make eye contact, and be enthusiastic. Because <laughs> everyone wants to join the party, right? You if you're like, If you're like, ah, I'm bored, uh, yeah. I'm not sure. Guys don't want to engage. Mm. So smile, because you look inviting. Mm -hmm. Make eye contact, because that builds trust and enthusiasm invites more engagement. Mm. And if you listen long enough, people will generally tell you what problem they want you to solve and how to solve it for them, even if they're not aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's how you get a deal. <laughs> this is insane. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, it was, uh, was an amazing learning experience. Mm. Uh, so I mean, tell me one of the deals that you closed in Washington. Washington, uh, I'll tell you the one and did you make some good money at, in that place? Yeah. There's one, actually, I found it already sort of in process when I moved to D.C. So my cousin, uh, Moots, near, near the house he had remodeled that I was living in, there was another house. Mm. Uh, an, an old elderly lady lived in there by herself. It was in very poor condition. And uh, she was behind on her rent to her landlord or landlady. And uh, very sad situation. For whatever reason, she was completely on her own. And she had some sort of disease that gave her, you know, you know that disease we, we learned about in school called elephantiasis. Mm -hmm, the big, the yeah, big legs. Yeah. She had such big legs, she couldn't move. Mm. And, you know, before, before I arrived, I remember, because we used to have compare notes with my cousin, Moots. He would tell me how he walked into the house to meet the lady and there were buckets, you know those 20 liter buckets mm. of paint. The living room was full of these buckets with a putrid stench. Uh, she used to go to bathroom in the buckets because she couldn't walk to the bathroom. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
Um, and the same was, was true upstairs. Uh, I mean, she was, she was not living. She was like, she was like dead, that mm. lady. So anyway, she, they finally get an eviction order and she got moved to more appropriate facilities. Good I think the yeah, state yeah. Uh, took over. So Moods had to take over this house. The landlady didn't want to deal with that mess. The grass in the backyard was like five foot tall. Uh, and, uh, you know, he hired some guys to clean out the place. So by the time I was arriving, it was empty, mm. actually. Mm. But now he had to figure out what to do with it. Yeah, so the owner of the property didn't want to sell it outright because of the taxes that w would have been due. The old lady, I think she was a Jewish lady, mm. uh, she had been collecting $400 a month from her tenant. She said, I, I like the $400 a month. So you take over her payments, do what you need to do with the house. If you sell it, fine, don't give me money. Just pay me $400 a month. What? That's what I want, yeah. Imagine that. So Moots had been doing this for some months by the time <laughs> I had arrived. So when I arrived, you know, we brainstormed a bit and we said, let's flip the thing. Let's either we fix it, because the one I was living in, for instance, uh, was valued at $250,000. Mm. Yeah, uh, I think all in he had spent maybe half of that buying and fixing it. This one, the lady uh, had a mortgage on it of I think $40,000. We knew if we fixed it to look like the one I was living in, it would match the value. It's mm -hmm. the same street, $250,000. So there's a good spread there mm -hmm. to, to repair the place. So before we could do that, there was this uh, sleek African-American guy we met. Uh, through my cousin Moots, uh, I, I forget his name now, but this guy was flashy, big, you know, barrel-chested guy, wore tailored suits with his name monogrammed on every sleeve and mm. collar. He drove a Bentley, Ooh. would feed dozens of people every weekend uh, over a Bible study, telling them how he used to be a druggy living in abandoned houses and now was worth hundreds of millions of dollars in real estate. And uh, he approached us and said, I, I want to buy the thing. I want to buy and fix it. Uh, so he made an offer for, for the house. Uh, and my cousin, uh, my cousin flipped it after I helped demolish the, you know, I was always the KYM, mm. even with Tina. Um, so anyway, after we cleaned out the place, uh, we flipped it for about a $60,000 profit. Ooh. Yeah. So what happens to that lady with the $400 a month? Uh, she just wanted her $400 a month. So, so you guys just ended up... See, 40K is hers. We didn't count it. The uh -huh. guy paid us 105K for the thing. Uh -huh. Put that 40K in and just put a standing order for Yeah, it. I mean, by the time I left DC, I never followed up with my cousin Mutsu what he did with the, with the older lady. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, deals like those he was doing on a consistent basis. Chai, chai, chai. Now, deals like those I did in North Carolina, I might make $5,000. <laughs> in his case, he's doing 12, 20x. So DC was a much friendlier place to... To, to flip houses. So, why then did you leave? You, I'm hearing you're only there for seven months. Yes. Um, I th and what year is this? This was 2000 and 2008? No, 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, December. I think it was December 13th, 2007 when I left uh, DC. So I moved to Texas. Uh, because my cousin and his ex-wife now were going through some uh, some difficulty, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it was no longer feasible for me to stay. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because I was there to to help them run the business. Mm. Uh, because he were, he came home and came back, and we we did some deals and so on. But things changed for him personally. Okay. So I moved to Houston, Texas, with my cousin. One mm. of my other cousins, Beatrice. Why, di why didn't you just do this alone in, in, in Washington? Because the cost for settling in D.C. is, is high. 
as well. Mm -hmm. Cost of living in DC is high. I mean, understandably, it's a capital. Yeah. Uh, I I didn't have the cash to mm -hmm. set up base there. Okay. On my own. Okay. Yeah. I get it. So so you move now to to Texas. Yeah, I moved to Texas with my cousin BT. Ika is no nowhere in the picture now. No, we were still talking actually. Uh, during that year, I was in DC. I uh, I proposed to Ika. <laughs> Dude, are you going to leave that out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, it took me a year to weasel my way back in yeah. into her heart, long distance. She's in North Carolina. Yeah, she's still working in North Carolina. I'd go visit her. I think I visited her once. She came visit me twice mm. uh, during that year. And uh, I think my being away and her having dumped me, removed a lot of presumed issues mm. and expectations yeah, so, and we were able to just have conversation as friends mm. um, and we would talk literally every day several times a day mm. uh, during that whole year i was gone and uh and during that year before i moved to texas i proposed and she said yes cool now that's a game changer now yeah now that you you i mean now that's you're, you're becoming committal what was it what was it that made you decide now nah, this is the lady i want to spend the rest of my life with i would have nightmares that she had hooked up with someone else or was married to someone else i woke up with cold sweats um, praying to god never to let it happen <laughs> and that's how i knew she 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 was the one for me. That's <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. <It's> a look. <laughs> yeah, and you know, at, at some point I figured if I wait for every situation to be perfect for me, I might never, you know, ask her to marry me. Mm. And she can't wait forever. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I took the leap of faith and uh miraculously she said yes and uh yeah i moved to to houston 